of floor if we could. Sound good? Yep. Perfect. So I, I think we're live. <laughs> so thanks everyone so much for joining us today. This is part of a series we started uh, at the beginning of the year called uh, Future Founders. And our, our, our purpose is just that, to inspire um, you, if you, this is you in the audience, to just do it. And so we've been talking to some great examples of that, entrepreneurs who left university or company context to take up the charge of starting and running their own company. And of course, we cherry picked fabulous examples, none better than Trevor Martin uh, today, who is the CEO of Mammoth Biosciences and just an amazing story of, uh, I, I, forgive me, Trevor, because I'm old enough to be able to say this, but a, a young guy with um, you know, just a, a huge ambition to, as, as Trevor puts it, democratize diagnostics. We do this uh, series uh, with um, an iconic organization dedicated to the same purpose, Y Combinator, and uh, with Reshma, who uh, was also a member of our community as an entrepreneur uh, before she joined the Y Combinator team. So that's us today. Um, we're going to um, begin, though, with uh, an introduction to Mammoth by Trevor. And so, Trevor, if you want to commandeer the screen and, and show some slides, that would be great. Happy to. Great. Hopefully you can see this okay. Looks great. Awesome. I'll put it in the presentation. Cool. So for those of you who aren't familiar with Mammoth, uh, what we're excited about at Mammoth is really building on all the exciting work um, that's been done in CRISPR and really kind of creating the next generation of CRISPR products, specifically in diagnostics and therapeutics. And when we think about like what's our vision for what the future of CRISPR can enable, um, some of the main things that we think about in the diagnostic side is decentralized testing and democratized access to testing and just really making a really broad set of highly accurate molecular tests available. And I think this is something that we've been working on since the very beginning of the company and the pandemic and COVID-19 has really made it super clear. And I think a lot of people were surprised that we don't have the ability to do this today. Mm -hmm. um, so that's been incredibly of course, validating for our mission has only inspired us more to really double down on this vision of how do we democratize access to high quality molecular information. Um, and then on the uh, therapeutic side and the editing side, we really think a lot about uh, in vivo applications and permanent cures and how do we actually enable the um, patient to have like a one-time treatment even to uh, get through a disease. So these are some of the things that we're hoping to enable with this next generation set of CRISPR proteins that we uh, discover and enable and develop and work with. Um, and more generally at Mammoth, we also have a, a kind of very fundamental view about CRISPR as this kind of search engine for biology. So rather than thinking of CRISPR as like, oh, it's an editing tool or, oh, it's a diagnostic tool or it's a um, specific kind of pair of scissors or something like that, we really think about it more generally as this way of interacting with biology where you can really target any nucleic acid of interest, whether you're trying to diagnose it, whether you're trying to edit it for a cure, whether you're actually not changing the nucleic acid at all and you're turning a gene on or off through methylation or something similar. And I think this is a very powerful way of thinking about CRISPR that really starts to unlock all sorts of uh, ways of thinking about CRISPR as this kind of homing beacon um, for biology. And uh, some of the things we work with are things like CASV and CAS14 and these really exciting new systems that are enabling new applications. And uh, for example, like CASV is part of this new class of ultra small CRISPR systems that are really uh, micro-sized compared to CAS9 um, and has huge applications for editing. And on the diagnostic side as well, proteins like CAS14 can really enable uh, really powerful diagnostic techniques that weren't possible uh, before. And more generally, I think one of the things I like to show here, because it's a little bit of a new concept, is how does CRISPR-based uh, diagnostics actually work? Um, and we have some really good videos on our website, actually, if you want to check them out on how this happens. But 
um, fundamentally, uh, you have to first take not just any protein. Uh, for example, Cas9 doesn't have the right properties for this. But you have to have these proteins that have this kind of nuclease activity that's unleashed after they recognize their target DNA or RNA. Um, so over here on the left, if you have this protein that's been programmed by the guide RNA to target a specific genetic sequence, so let's say you want to detect SARS-CoV-2. Um, so you design a guide that's specific to that sequence, but it won't bind a flu or human DNA or RNA. Um, or, and once you have that programmed, you can then you know, have a tube of spit or whatever sample type you are trying to detect this uh, disease in. And you can actually uh, combine the protein into that tube along with, for example, reporter molecules that are molecules that uh, once they're cleaved, they actually release some sort of fluorescence or color. So they actually can read out the signal. And what happens is that if and only if the um, protein and this, this kind of special CRISPR protein finds its target, um, it unleashes this nuclease activity and that cleaves these reporter molecules. Um, so you go from binding this kind of target to cleaving many reporter molecules and that's both a readout and an amplification of the signal. Um, so that's a really exciting new way of doing molecular detection. And I'll just briefly give a little bit about myself as well. Um, so I'm actually originally from Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, which is the land of Coke, Krispy Kreme, and y'all. Uh, I don't have any Southern accent at all, but I do use the word y'all a lot. I think it's just a very efficient word. Um, and I drink a lot of Coke, including right now. Um, and uh, for college, I went to Princeton, um, where I uh, joined this program, headed up by a guy named David Botstein, who many of you may know, um, that really made, basically the goal was to trick physicists and mathematicians into becoming biologists, and they were incredibly successful. And I really fell in love with biology in college. Uh, that's a picture of me, uh, one of the last times I ever did wet lab work, probably, because mm -hmm. um, I quickly switched over to computational biology over on the left there. Um, then uh, from there, I went directly to graduate school over at Stanford uh, for computational biology. Uh, went back to my roots. It's this old pro for anyone that's in the Bay Area. Uh, I think they might have gone out of business, unfortunately, <laughs> during the pandemic, but good times. Um, and then uh, after graduate school, I was very fortunate to team up with uh, Jennifer and Janice and Lucas to start uh, Mammoth Biosciences. And I'm also uh, a truly amateur uh, artist and baker as well, mostly uh, modern art because I really can't draw anything. So I have to deal with what I have. Um, and just a little bit about Mammoth. So we've undergone a lot of growth. Uh, in the last three years. So we actually started out at MBC Biolabs over there on the left in Dogpatch, probably around 11 people at that time. Uh, and then we actually moved over to South San Francisco, uh, the campus of one of our investors, Verily. Um, we did a lot of growth there. Um, and then now actually I'm in our new building, which is over in Brisbane. Um, and it's a really nice new facility where we have plenty of room to grow even further to the next level. Uh, and I think the most important thing to know, though, is that, yeah, we just have a really awesome team, and I'm extremely privileged to work with both my co-founders, who are up here in front with me, uh, Janice, Lucas, and of course, Jennifer, who we're congratulating for, you know, a small prize she won recently. <laughs> um, and the rest of the team, really, that's, I think, I mean, even before we get into questions, if there's one thing that I say could say is, like, really the biggest perk of doing a startup is just working with really highly ambitious, awesome people. Um, and of course, you know, you can do that in academia as well, but don't feel like that's something you're sacrificing and going to a startup, because that's what I enjoy the most is the people that I work with. Um, so with that, I will stop talking about myself. <laughs> no, no, I hate to tell you, Trevor, but you've only just begun that. So <laughs> that's super cool. Hey, um, your uh, entrepreneurial journey is really quite distinct, in, at least in my memory of um, the origin story for Mammoth, which is it didn't emerge directly from your graduate work as much as your ability to recognize an opportunity and then to pull the threads together to weave the cloth that's Mammoth today. Is that, first of all, a fair summary? Well, yeah, so it definitely isn't my work, to be clear. And that's why I'm really, really privileged to work with uh, like Janice, Lucas, and Jennifer, and I mean, obviously the rest of the team as well. Um, but yeah, it definitely is work that's come out of Jennifer's lab, and uh, that's kind of the seed of what has become Mammoth uh, now. And I think that there, uh, what was exciting is that, you know, before I'd ever met uh, the rest of the crew, um, definitely 
I had this excitement around like the intersection of synthetic biology and diagnostics and kind of really feeling like it's a space that felt like computational biology did 10 years ago. Not that computational biology doesn't have like really exciting stuff going on now, but just like totally wide open field with all sorts of opportunity. And, uh, you know, in 10 years, I think that many of these things will be standard tools that are just kind of maybe even taken for granted. But right now, like really, there's just huge amounts of white space in terms of high impact, really meaningful work that can be done and taking something that's just a few steps away from basic biology, which is super cool, and actually creating awesome products with it that can help people. Um, so uh, I was really fortunate to link up with uh, the inventors of this technology that uh, also shared this vision before they even met me, of course. Uh, and I think that made it very clear that this is something that we could team up on and really have a huge impact, um, really kind of changing the world with these new CRISPR technologies. So, so tell me how that happened. Did you read the paper and go, wow, that should be a company? Or did you say, I want to, uh, the next step, chapter in my life wants to be in a company. And then the paper was the next step in that process. Which came yeah. first, the chicken or the egg? Uh, I mean, everything's related. But I think uh, even before the paper had been come out publicly, um, definitely was really excited about this concept of just the intersections of, intersection of synthetic biology and especially underdog fields like diagnostics was at the time. Now I would say that's not quite the same pace, um, but especially three years ago, um, it would be very difficult to get an investor to pick up the phone for a diagnostics company yeah. um, compared to like, at least relative to like a therapeutics application. Yeah. Um, and I think there, I don't know, something's just attractive about that to me. Um, so I was actually... Uh, looking around at, you know, different technologies. And I have to admit, yeah, when I saw these papers come out, I was like, wow, this is way better than anything that I'm, you know, thinking about because I'm not a trained synthetic biologist, to be frank. Um, so yeah, just kind of reached out kind of cold in terms of, hey, like, I'm really excited about this. I think there's a lot of opportunity here and it's something that's meaningful and could be really uh, both fun and impactful to work on. Uh, and yeah, I think it really comes down to people you want to work with right <laughs> at the end of the day yeah um, and very fortunate that we really hit it off and uh shared this vision of how we could uh actually take this out of the lab and into people's lives to improve them um and i'm not going to say that's like an overnight process right, right. um and especially during the pandemic i imagine it's hard to like really connect with people i think there is value to like in-person connection especially for things like co-founder conversations and things like that um, but this is obviously pre-pandemic, so many, you know, dinners and just getting to know people. And I think that's really important as well. Not necessarily in terms of like, oh, like this person, um, have like this certain skill set. I think more fundamentally, like in a startup, you're going to have to grow in all sorts of different directions. So it really comes down to more, is this someone that I want to grow with? Mm. How, tell us a bit more about that gestation period. How long did between that first email to them and when you really said, okay, great, let's start a company together. How long did that take? I, it up. Uh, I would say months, not weeks. <laughs> uh -huh. And and then you're, w one of the other things that um, I think about that stage in your company development is you had to get a license out of Berkeley for CRISPR-Cas9 technologies, and that couldn't have been a trivial matter. Not Cas9, but yeah, other CRISPR yeah. technologies. Yeah, <laughs> sorry about that. Yeah, so, Cas yeah. so that was, that must not have been a trivial exercise navigating the, that path. I think, yeah, I mean, in the early days of a startup, everything's non-trivial and new and hard. And I mean, I think that's kind of a first litmus test almost for, is this something you'll be excited by? Because that will never go away. It'll change and evolve. Yeah. Um, but I think maybe that's a feature, not a bug of early startup life is that it's definitely, and this is somewhere where I think uh, people underappreciate actually how much like a PhD can help you with a startup in terms of the whole point of a PhD is you're doing something new that hasn't been done before. There's no textbook for how to do it. You're yeah. actually blazing a new trail. And that's actually, I think, very analogous to many of the things you're doing early on at startup. Obviously, like, you know, different things you're doing and different goals, but uh, fundamentally, it's dealing with uncertainty. And I think uh, anyone that's in a PhD or has done a PhD can tell you that dealing with uncertainty is definitely a big part of that process. Um, so I think that's something that actually there is a lot of transferable skill. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I mean, licensing out of university is like always um, one of the big things like an early startup does. 
Mm -hmm. um, and uh, in general, I think that's one of just like a hundred things that, <laughs> that is very yeah. difficult at the beginning. Uh, and then, um, and when you came to NBC Biolabs, you were what, four at that point? Is that where you started? Uh, something like that, yeah. Okay, yeah, and then grew, <laughs> grew to ultimately 11 before leaving us. Which is really, which is really interesting, but now I think your slides said you're what eighty nine people. No, yeah, well, it's changing every day, so it might be <laughs> around ninety now. Um, no, but yeah, yeah. It's definitely growing very rapidly, which is exciting, and uh, you know, it's hard to put your finger on like each stage of the company, but definitely like as you go from like obviously you know just the co-founders to like ten people, and then to fifty people, and then to a hundred people, and then to a thousand people. There's definitely like the company starts operating a little bit differently. You have to like learn new skills. You have to do things differently yourself. Mm -hmm. um, like I think an example there uh, for me is in terms of, okay, like once the company is getting uh, to this, you know, slightly larger size, still much smaller than many companies out there. Mm -hmm. um, and you have really awesome, even you know, fellow executive team members, like you really have to make sure you're leveraging people and trusting them deeply, right? Mm -hmm. And like maybe early days, like you just do everything yourself, right? Mm -hmm. um, but you have to be able to evolve and make sure that, okay, like you've hired people for a reason and they're really intelligent. They're way better than you probably at whatever area, like hopefully mm -hmm. you've hired someone that's way better than you. Mm -hmm. um, so really like adjusting how you operate and making sure that uh, you're fully leveraging people at different stages of the company. Um, so that's like an example of um, something I think is exciting in terms of like your own growth and evolution that can only be offered in a startup almost, mm -hmm. um, but also something that uh, can be like a challenge as well, like as you're going through each stage. Yeah, huge challenge. I, I think um, you know, managing people effectively to create cohesive, productive teams is a never ending um, challenge. So I have to commend you for that amongst all the other amazing things you've done. Let's go back though to um, when you first moved into our lab, had you raised any capital at that point? I think we'd raised a seed round at that point. Okay. NFX. So NFX took a bet on us very early on. And uh, and then there was more capital that came along quickly thereafter too, right? Yep. So then Mayfield Fund led our Series A like very shortly after our seed round. Um, and that was after we'd moved into NBC, which was helpful for actually generating some of our own data, <laughs> um, which is obviously helpful for raising uh, our Series A. So we, we know her, she well, is a wonderful guy. Um, but I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about how that went for you. How was the um, early fundraising experience? What was that early fundraising experience like? Yeah, I think in general, um, I mean, it's both exciting and difficult. Um, I think the early fundraising experience, especially like pre-pandemic for something that's diagnostics focused, this definitely can be an uphill battle. Mm -hmm. I think that's where we were very fortunate to have um, investors that really believed in this kind of application of CRISPR. And we definitely don't take that for granted. And I think, of course, it's been you know, validated since then. Um, but more broadly, I think uh, it's really, it can be a productive process, not just for uh, the company raising money, but also for like refining your thinking. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's something that's underappreciated by the fundraising process is it's not just like getting a check in the door, but it's also like testing your ideas against what's out there. I'm going to turn the lights back on. <laughs> okay, so, go ahead. That's a, that is a really sage uh, point, Trevor. I've seen uh, many companies uh, come and, and pitch and then it's not quite a good fit for us. And then they come back six months later and the deck looks completely different. And it isn't different because of the data, it's different because of all those iterative conversations that occurred along the way that have improved the story. So that's really, but that was very, that was a very compressed time period for you. And uh, um, yeah. we, we happily are tiny investors on your cap yeah. table. Wish it was larger. It was a bad timing for us <laughs> between funds. Yeah. But um, I remember you went to you went from looking for money to oversubscribe pretty quickly. <laughs> yeah, no, we were very fortunate to have a lot of interest, and uh, yeah, 
I think that's uh, you know the ideal outcome always from that process, <laughs> yeah. but definitely don't take it for granted. Yeah, and there's a it's an interesting uh, sort of symptom too of the cooperativity of financing. You know, once once it starts to happen, then it can ha then it, it gets easier. Yeah. It's always finding the lead. I would say. Yeah. Yeah. Advice. And then, um, uh, and then you've raised a lot more capital since mm -hmm. then. Um, I know less about that end of the, well, it's not the end of the rainbow for you by any stretch of imagination, <laughs> but I know less about those subsequent steps than I knew about early financing. Tell, is there a difference? Has that, has that changed? Um, yeah, so definitely as you move from different types to investors, different types of investors, like there's different things they want to see and like there's a different process and in some ways it becomes like maybe more formalized or maybe not easier is the wrong word, but it's like more predictable what people uh -huh. want to see almost. Uh -huh. um, whereas maybe early days, it's like pure narrative <laughs> almost. Um, so it can be a little bit more wishy-washy, like how you should craft it or like why something's working or not working. Um, but yeah, as the company matures, you have more data that you can fall back on and you have more kind of classic milestones that you've achieved, hopefully. Um, yeah, so that's, I think, each fundraising is its definitely own kind of process. One uh, question actually I'm genuinely curious about is uh, recruiting board members, recruiting an independent, for instance, uh, to your board. When did, How early on in the process did you recruit an independent board member? Um, pretty early. Uh, and I think our first independent board member came from an advisor conversation. Uh -huh. um, so... I think uh, Manish Jain was like someone we were introduced early as like a diligence call actually, uh -huh. um, but he really liked what we were doing and uh, he was founded multiple companies in the diagnostic space. Uh, so we were really interested in kind of leveraging his expertise and he was excited about uh, working with us. So very quickly that morphed from like an advisor, well, a diligence to an advisor to like an independent board member. Uh, and I think that's actually like maybe not an atypical way for it to go. Because um, you want to work with someone for a while, of course, as well, before you bring them onto that kind of formal position. And what I really want to ask you, I can't ask you because you can't say in a public forum, but uh, yeah. has the board been helpful to you is the question I want to ask and I can't. So. I an answer to get to that. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, the genuine answer is that I think we are very fortunate <clears throat> to have a really great board. Um, definitely, I've heard hard stories and I think the board composition is something to think about a lot um, because it can either be something that's like very helpful or something that like drags the company down. Um, and it's not just like each individual board member, it's also like the whole dynamic together um, and like how people work together and like respect each other. And that's definitely not something to take for granted as well as like that a good dynamic across the entire board because that can be easy to mess up as well. Yep. Um, <clears throat> so I think that especially as the company grows, like early on, maybe the board will be like really small, like only one investor or something. So it's more of like a one-on-one -on -one relationship, but especially as the board grows, actually like board management and like composition becomes a bigger um, kind of thing to start crafting and thinking about seriously as well. Yeah, it's an, it's an issue we've been, you know, um, there's actually been a survey uh, where entrepreneurs uh, are asked to sort of judge the value of the board, and then the same board members are asked, and the the board, of course, thinks of themselves as being very important, and the entrepreneurs slightly less so. But uh, of course, it's a time dependent thing when you go to exit or negotiate a transaction or hire a key employee. That's when you really uh, can lean on them. So, um, what um, it. I mean, your your arc of the company was so uh, it was like a Hollywood story, but there must have been things that you learned along the way that you would do differently if you could replay the movie. Is there anything that you share with us that lessons learned? Um, yeah, it's an interesting question. Definitely, uh, you know, we've been very fortunate in many ways, mm -hmm. um, and I think yeah, going back. I don't know if it's something we changed necessarily, but I think I didn't fully appreciate at the beginning how much of a company is less about like, oh, like necessarily, uh, like have you chosen the exact right market or have you chosen the exact right, you know, flavor of the technology and like optimized it exactly. 
and it really is more a collection of people going after a vision and that's like mm -hmm. if you optimize that and do really well there then like everything else becomes a lot easier mm -hmm. um so i think and that's something where i think maybe like higher education prepares you a little bit less unfortunately in terms of like uh not just people management it's kind of a weird word but just like uh inspiration and like you know making sure that everyone's on the same page and uh that's somewhere that i think uh even for just academic lines of work, I think it'd be good to have more training for PhDs there. But especially going over to a company, um, that's an area where it'd be good to understand early on that like actually that's gonna be a huge part of any co-founder's job um, is like that kind of more touchy-feely kind of people uh, interaction. And yeah, just that aspect of the business is actually like super critical at every stage. Yes, actually, you raise a really interesting point. This is a footnote, but um, you know, the academic uh, getting a PhD and getting a successful postdoc is so much dependent on the first author, and less about teamwork as much as academics want to be and are collaborative. Whereas in the company, all of you have you know a singular purpose, which is the success of the company, and it's a different mindset when. Uh, it's a group product output rather than individual product output. Yeah, no, definitely. I think, yeah, sometimes it can be easy in academia to kind of like demonize startups. It's like, I don't know, money grubbing or something like that. Mm -hmm. But it actually can be a bit of a feature, not a bug, because it's not a zero sum game. Like an authorship list, yeah, you can put, you know, asterisk next to five people or whatever, but it is a bit of a zero sum game. Someone's the first author, a group of someone's, and someone's the last author, and then there's some ordering in between. Uh, so, whereas at a company, like, you know, yeah, there's papers published, but at the end of the day, if it works, then everyone's rewarded handsomely. Yeah. Uh, and if it doesn't work, then no one's <laughs> rewarded. Right. Um, so it can actually be an incentive that's a little bit more like even fair in some ways and like egalitarian. Um, so yeah, it's not a zero sum game in the way that uh, credit can be, right? And like the uh, accolades and stuff. I find that uh... here, Trevor. I'm sorry to interrupt. Him. I, I'm really like um, intrigued by your description of your interest in diagnostics. Like it seems to be a theme going way back in time. Can you like double click on that for us and maybe tell a little bit about why you were so interested in diagnostics back in the day? Um, I think originally it just came from it being a bit of an underdog field, <laughs> um, <laughs> honestly. Uh, like similar to how. Uh, when I first started getting involved in like computational biology, it was a bit like less of a sexy field um, mm -hmm. in terms of like people maybe saw biology as a bit more stodgy and like, okay, like it's more interesting to apply, I don't know, statistics to physics or something. And I think you're seeing that now with like fields like psychology and sociology and things like that as well, where like <clears throat> people are like, oh, wait, like actually there's all this exciting intersection of these fields that maybe people didn't think could be so computational, but now are becoming really exciting for that application. Um, I mean, for the aspiring entrepreneurs in the audience, do you like recommend that underdog approach or like do you think oh. that it really worked? Or? <laughs> yeah, it's a double edged sword. Uh, I think it, it, obviously. We're working with CRISPR as well, so that's like the opposite end of that spectrum, right? It's definitely not an underdog. It's you know extremely hot field, uh, so that helps like the balance of those two. Yeah. But I think that's always an interesting combination of like something that's like really uh, the center of attention and is making a ton of progress, and then a field that maybe has been like a little bit more ignored. I think there's like very interesting intersections there often. Um, but I mean, more generally, for me personally, I guess like early on. I resigned myself that I was never going to be like the best biologist or the best like statistician. Like, I don't know, maybe I can be like top 10% or something, but probably not top 1%. Yeah. You know. uh, so then if you work at the intersection of fields, then you're top 10% of each, then okay, you can actually be uh, top 1% um, and actually contribute something most importantly, yeah. um, maybe unique. Uh, so I think that's why I also like the intersection of fields is that uh, like, I feel like an act like, there's actually some advantage there and some like unique insight that could be offered um, that maybe I couldn't offer just like within a single field. So at the very beginning, when you were raising your seed round, did you have this like intersection message as part of that initial um, kind of pitch or what did that come over time? 
Um, yeah, it's a good question. Uh, I don't know if we had this like intersection message as part of it. I think it's more focused on the impact it could have, which is like mm -hmm. enabling this new class of molecular testing. Um, but that impact is through this intersection of, you know, diagnostic field and brand new, really cutting edge synthetic biology. Um, yeah, I don't know if that was front and center originally. What do you think like helped you most in that seed round? What message um, like really resonated and helped you get off the ground? Um, I mean, I think in general, working with CRISPR, I have to say, <laughs> you know, <laughs> helps. Um, having a really amazing co-founding team. Uh, so I definitely don't take those for granted. Um, I think more generally, in terms of uh, what helps the most, I think in general, the combination of a very kind of exciting technology more generally, doesn't necessarily have to be CRISPR, with a market that's like large but hasn't had much innovation is like always a recipe for excitement, um, yeah. especially early on when it's, you don't know, maybe have as much data as you'd have later in terms of like actually showing that uh, you've hit all these miles. Did you miles have in. any data at the Yeah, at well, the we were fortunate to have like some scientific papers that have been published, um, mm -hmm. even demonstrating actually uh, Janice and Lucas had taken uh, the technology to UCSF and worked with a professor there to actually um, diagnose some patients for HPV. Um, so that was super cool to be able to have in that paper and uh, show it. Data was in the public domain, right? Or or was it like assigned to your? Well, it's in the paper, yeah. Um, so obviously we had a license from the university, but yeah, the data was in the paper. Um, so that was definitely helpful as well. That and even in the paper it had been taken, you know, to the clinic essentially. Um, but more generally, I think. Uh, especially for the early rounds, it really is like a narrative question in my mind. Um, like you can have all the data in the world, but especially for an early stage investor, I think they'll either believe what you're doing and think there's something big or not pretty quickly. And then like the data is like validating or not, but it's not like, it's very tough. I would say if you're starting from a position of like, I don't think this is like something that's interesting. And then you're trying to prove it with data, you can, but that's a rough spot. To be so i think the narrative early on is super important yeah. will you flash back to us like the narrative that you um started with that to give people a sense of like you know how you presented it at that at that time uh yeah i'd have to dig up the old decks but i think it really was the same thing it is today and that's kind of what's interesting is this mm -hmm. kind of democratization of diagnostics and obviously mm -hmm. that story has expanded now as we've developed new proteins and uh they have like really exciting editing and therapeutic applications but fundamentally the story is really the same of new CRISPR systems with these new properties and novel uh development of these into different methods uh enables new products and the democratization of diagnostics uh, is kind of first and foremost, and we're you know, launching products this year, even in that space. Um, but more generally, I think that narrative of just like the next generation of CRISPR has always been front and center. And what does that enable in terms of impact for patients? Yeah. And how much diligence did went into that first round? Like, was there a data room? Did they like look at the licensing agreements? Did they do like you know, uh, CRISPR versus, I don't know, uh, PCR versus phages or, you know, that type of analysis. So I'll, um, I'll that. Sure. Yeah. So, I mean, the diligence is different every round. So yeah, for a series A, definitely there's like a huge amount of diligence. Um, Let's go through seed. Let's go through seed. Yeah. So for the seed round, definitely a lot of diligence, but I think that's even more like narrative driven, let's say. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um so there's some things like okay do you actually have access to the technology like is the whole team going full time like these are kind of like the basic questions um and then beyond that you know you have other things like you have various corporate documents but they're all pretty standard form so that's not really what is being looked at um so i think yeah especially the seed it's more okay do I believe the narrative? And then do I see that there's like some direction you could head in terms of like access to IP and uh, the team itself? Like, do I think they're competent enough to pull this off? Like, you know, assuming everything went really well. Um, and then in series A, I think it gets a little bit more to that next level of like, okay, now 
I really wanted to understand on a deep level and get a ton of expert opinions about how good is the IP and uh, have they shown their ability to like recruit anyone? So it kind of goes level to level um, as you hit more milestones. This really resonates. I'm like reading applications for YC right now and it's like, yeah. has everyone gone full time? What kind yeah. of IP is there? Yeah. <laughs> like it's a, a similar um, kind of. Yeah. Uh, Pretty full benefit of the doubt and like hopefully with full like and if, if with full benefit of the doubt it's still difficult to understand then that's like a problem but as long as there's some path um and it's exciting for sure for sure we we'll also want to encourage um audience members to er, to type your questions into the chat um or use the q a tool your your choice and i'll uh synthesize as we kind of move on to but um Sorry, Doug. I do kind of derailed your your line of. No, no, it's the same. Here. It's the same rail. No, it's it's <laughs> perfect. <laughs> yeah, I think the first couple of questions um, that we got in the in the chat were uh, trying to get to that that deciding moment when you yeah. were uh, in the lab. You were still a graduate student. You were what twenty seven at that point, probably when you were. Uh, yeah, I was born in eighty nine. So. <laughs> <laughs> and so I think the first, you know, the questions that are on a couple of the audience members' minds are, are that decision-making process, that, that, yeah, the fear and, and hope that went into that moment. Um, yeah, I mean, I don't think there's like any specific moment. I mean, in, in some ways, like starting a company is like a irrational act, especially when you're not the, uh, inventor of the technology um, and it's like more of a broad idea um, so yeah I think early like towards the end of my PhD I think the first thing that I realized is that I really did want to like have a more direct impact and I, that's not a ding against academia in any way it's just a different thing to do is mm -hmm. like have a bit more of a direct translation of things into people's lives uh, and just I, I don't know if there's too much thought behind it, I'm just thinking that that could be something that's like pretty rewarding and I hadn't done before and would, it's mm -hmm. just exciting generally. Um, so that was maybe the first decision. So I started kind of learning more about the space and there's like a lot of jargon and lingo and there's mm -hmm. the fortunate thing about being in the Bay Area. And I think one of the reasons why there are so many startups is that there's like this whole culture of like doing startups. So it makes it a lot easier to envision like, oh, okay, like I can do that. I've seen people do it. And I think that's underappreciated as well in terms of like a network effect of the Bay Area. And that mm -hmm. I think goes a long way to why there's so many exciting startups going on here. It's just like seeing that people have done it before and there being a whole ecosystem to support people thinking about it and like trying to learn, okay, what is like a convertible note and like all this lingo that can actually be a bit of a barrier sometimes. Um, it can be a bit scary. Uh, in terms of the kind of things following that, I think there's definitely some kind of key moments in terms of like getting introduced further to the ecosystem. And I think one of the unfortunate things that I hope gets solved over time is it still is like very person network driven. Like there, you like you really do have to like kind of meet some people that have done it before and like really learn from them and then they can introduce you to people, which I don't, I don't think it's like a specifically exclusionary, but I think that's somewhere where the ecosystem could improve is like, and get more people from non-traditional backgrounds as if that's somehow opened up more. And I don't think it's like malicious necessarily from any individual person, but it just can be difficult to like break into that network. And yeah. I think I got lucky a couple of times where just at like events at Stanford, I would connect with some people that ended up being super helpful uh, without asking for anything in return um, and like introduced me to other people that then became our first investors or helped me understand like weird concepts or, you know, think through difficult problems. So. Uh, and also during the pandemic, it's interesting how much that's available as well now versus not, I'm not entirely sure at the moment. So one thing I do try and do is for people that are in that position, I try and help them out as much as I can. Uh, Cause I know how difficult that was for me, especially people that haven't been in the ecosystem before to like try and learn about it and like get connected with people that can help them. Um, Cause I think that is really important. And that is one of the advantages of like being in the Bay area typically is that there are more opportunities for that serendipity. Do you know? Um, and I are very excited about this prospect of like, yeah. you know, people from a non-traditional background getting some exposure to what could an alternative path possibly. Yeah, yeah, exactly. 
So this isn't a question, but just an observation. Do you, do you know this um, uh, wonderful video called How to Create a Movement by Derek Sievers? If uh, not, you should Google it someday. It's about a rock concert where this guy off in the fringes is dancing in sort of a wild way, and someone comes over and joins him, and the next thing you know, the entire audience at this rock concert is dancing with them. Uh, and, uh, and the point he makes is that you don't have to be, it wasn't the guy dancing off in the corner that made the movement, it was the guy that joined or nucleated that. So one person is not a movement. But once you start getting people together, then you can nucleate a movement. And one of the things that's really uh, extraordinary about you, and I'm going to embarrass you, is how good you are at this, how good you are with people, which is no doubt why you are <clears throat> both the 30 under 30 and 40 under 40. And we, today I can announce you're the Doug 50 under 50. Okay. <laughs> important one. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, it's really a commendable aspect. I don't think it's absolutely necessary. I mean, there's some shy people that, that lead and, and thrive as entrepreneurs too, but it does mean it does help you so much that you are good at that aspect of the job. Yeah, definitely uh, appreciate that. But yeah, it's definitely a constant evolution and growth as well. Um, yeah, I think that also even means something different at every stage of the company. And that's like, I think one of the most exciting things about a startup is like being able to like develop these types of skills. But then that's also like one of the biggest challenges, is like constantly developing these skills. So, yeah. Um, but just really, I'm, questions, you know, yeah. Um, in the chat about competition, like how do you think about being a crowded space or like um, alternatives? Uh, and if people like say that to you, like, what do you uh, respond with? Maybe you can talk about uh, that a little bit. Yeah, and I mean, it's important to understand your competition and to know like why you're differentiated and things like that. I think people can focus too much on it. Like, I, I don't know if I can name an example of a startup that like failed because of competition necessarily. I think that's pretty unusual. Like maybe it can be more difficult to raise money or something or, uh, you know, maybe they're stealing your PR, but I mean, really, I think what I try and remind myself of even is that you're either going to succeed or fail on the merits of what you're building. That's one of the nice things about a startup is that at the end of the day, you have a product that hopefully helps people and works mm -hmm. and takes market share. And I think you can worry more about competition, like when you're on public markets and trying to capture a market share. Um, maybe that's a good time to think about that more. Um, not think about it more, but like worry about it more. Um, but it's really hard not to worry about competition, of course. Um, but I think people ascribe too much like angst or existential value to it when you know it can be a good sign as well. Like, okay, that means you're working on something people find exciting, and mm -hmm. uh, clearly you're not the only believer. Maybe you should be concerned if you're the only believer in something. And obviously, you have to have your moats and reasons why you know over the next twenty years, like you do win and dominate any competition like that. You absolutely need to have, but in terms of like worrying about it or things like that, it's hard not to, but I think it's actually not the most productive thing. What about when you're messaging it? Like um, say you have an investor who's like, oh, this is a really competitive space. Like, do you say that we're differentiated or do you say that like we're, um, you know, we're not looking at the competition? I guess, how do you respond to it? Yeah, well, I think you do need to understand them really well. Like it's a bad sign I'd say if you like don't know either who your competition is or like why you're differentiated. You have to need to have like very good answer mm -hmm. about your differentiation. Um, and I think it is important with investors, right? Because, you know, that's one of the things they can look at and they're trying to understand is like, okay, assume everything went right. Like, why are they going to win versus anyone else that's doing this? Um, so, yeah, but I, I think the main point is that I don't think you should worry about it so much in terms of like existential risk to the company and like is the company going to be successful i think it's a huge thing for fundraising and like you need to have good messaging and things like that um but it, i would worry about it less in terms of like if you build a great product and it's like you know fulfilling a huge market need then you're going to be good so i mean that dovetails well to the next question which is like if the value proposition is not obvious or too early to be seen like how do you get investors to make an early bet? Yeah, it's tricky. I mean, I guess in some ways, hopefully the value proposition is obvious to you at least. 
Um, if it's not obvious to you, that I think that's a genuine problem. Now, can you convince others about that? That's like a different question. But I think if you truly believe in the value proposition and it's more like others are having trouble believing that, then you can start figuring out what you're messaging incorrectly or like it's not resonating. But I think if you're trying to start a company and you don't understand the value proposition, then that's like the classic trap of like, you have a tool and you're trying to find like a problem and people really rag on that. I think a lot of biotech companies start that way and that's fine. I actually don't think it's that big of a deal, but like you do need to figure out what the problem is mm -hmm. um, before you have a company. Or, so like, how do you outgrow it? Like what's the, in your experience, how would you outgrow a concern about having a solution and like looking for a problem? Yeah, I mean, talking to a lot of people, doing market research, uh, yeah, just like anything you can do to get more information about um, uh, like gaps in the market, talking to even your competitors, maybe through different means, or like the big company versions of you. Uh, yeah, but in general, I think you do need to at least internally have like some really clear, okay, like this is a huge problem that this technology can solve. I don't think it's a bad thing though to start with the technology and like search for that, but you really do have to go through that search and like figure it out. Like the classic advice you'll get from like a generic startup I don't know, class is that you start with the problem and then you like find the solution. But like in biotech, it's never quite that simple, I would say, because like you have 10 years of research going into something and then like, okay, there's these applications, but maybe there's new market. Is there some other application? So I wouldn't be embarrassed that that's like the way it's being approached. I think that's the genuine way that probably the majority of biotech companies honestly are coming out. But that doesn't mean that you can't do that step. Like you do need to like search around and figure out like what is the number one problem Maybe it's different short term and long term. That's not the worst thing in the world either. Maybe there's like some bootstrapping thing where then you can tackle like the real market later. Um, but yeah, you do need to get through that process and you do need to have a clear value proposition before like I think getting like a ton of investment. Yeah. There's a couple of good questions in the in the chat. Uh, one is uh, what, how, where'd you get the name Mammoth from? Oh, um, the company originally had a different name, uh, but it was very unspellable. Uh, so we started looking around at different names and I think we just landed on animals for some reason. So <laughs> animal name. Uh, and then Mammoth, I mean, it's not like a super clean story, but it's kind of a cheeky play on uh, resurrecting mammoths with CRISPR, it's kind of funny. Uh, okay. And then also uh, there's like the idiom, the elephant in the room, uh, you can't like can't ignore it. <laughs> But then a mammoth's like even bigger, so it's even like less ignorable. Uh, and then I know, the domains are available, so that's nice too. And it and makes for great t-shirts. Yeah, and it's a cute little logo. So. <laughs> the next question's uh, more serious, and it's actually, I uh, would love to hear about this, is what did you do to go about to acquire the skills you needed for the people management side of the business? And how did those skills evolve? Yeah, I mean, I think that one, there's a lot of just like learning on the job, I'd say, for better or for worse. Um, but I think more importantly uh, than that, it's like just being conscientious about it even. Um, and that can manifest in a lot of different ways. So one is, uh, you know, just on your own thinking about it and like trying to make sure that you're growing. Uh, the other one is like investing time and money into it. So like uh, coaches and things like that, actually, I think are super high value um especially for uh like new co-founders um and i think people often like under invest in that i would say uh and because it can seem expensive uh for sure but i think that even at the high prices these coaches often are like it's still a really good deal if you find the right person and you shouldn't be afraid to like cycle through a bunch of people like i don't know sometimes it's just not a fit and there's a lot of you know coaches that are not great for an individual person. Um, but I think putting time in to like find a coach that you think is really good actually pays a huge amount of dividends. Um, and yeah, just in general, being open about like, okay, you need to like grow a bunch. Uh, I think that's a powerful concept. Those are really, that's a really sage comments. I know uh, Dan Woodmayer at uh, Bolt has also recommended um, coaches. It's great to stand back and reflect with somebody on how things are going rather than just always letting things happen. It's a, it's a good idea for all of us. Um, yeah, no, I think being conscientious about it is like a superpower here. <laughs> yeah, exactly. 
Uh, let's see, we have a long question that just came in. Um, and it's, uh, how important is the IP, um, uh, it, particularly in the early rounds for um, once the IP is follow, uh, filed and the information is public to the world and people with more resources can easily modify and improve it, return to fee can be expensive, trade secrets, all those sorts of things. So maybe you can just sort of, how important has uh, IP been to uh, Mammoth's uh, growth? I yeah, maybe I'll answer the question slightly more generically. And it's obviously specific to every company, but I think in biotech in particular, like IP is really important. It can't be underestimated. Mm -hmm. uh, whereas in like a tech company or something, know, people might get mad at you for spending much money on patents. Um, because it's just it's a just a different model in some ways, right? So for a biotech company, let's say a classic therapeutics company, it could be eight years before you get to market, right? And that's eight years of billion dollars, hundreds of millions of dollars of investment. Mm -hmm. um, but you need to have something where you think you can actually defend it if, you know, after that's done, someone can't just come along and then steal the whole market and take all that work and, you know, build their own therapeutic, exactly the same as yours. So that's where patents and IP come in. So it can often be like demonized as well, but I think there is a real argument there about, okay, how do you enable eight years and a billion dollars of investment? Well, if you have a piece of paper that says that for at least a period of time, yeah. For the next 10 years after that, you're the one that can sell this, at least some manifestation of it, then yeah. you start to be able to get a return on investment for all that money that went into that. And also the hundred other companies that you invested that much money in that never came to market. Yeah. Um, so I'm not saying the system is flawless either, but I think that people do underestimate how important IP is, not just like to the ecosystem in general, but also to an individual company in terms of like any seed investor that kind of knows their salt is going to say, okay, this company is going to go have to raise for the next, you know, five years or whatever, and it's tons more money. Like, what are they going to tell these investors that's going to say, okay, someone else can't just start three years after us and do the same thing? Um, and there's always, wait, you know, is you can gauge your IP, right? Like, okay, how good is it or bad is it? And like, that's a judgment for each investor to make for themselves. Um, but I think in general, I. Uh, I think for any early stage biotech company, it is good to think deeply about your IP strategy and really understand like, what are you defending first of all? And can you articulate that well? Mm -hmm. I've seen a lot of places where, I don't know, maybe it's, you need to have a, some co cohesive narrative around what you're actually defending too. Cause that's like way more compelling than like, okay, we have some random patents and we have patents. I mean, that's like maybe some base level, but I think what would be really helpful, especially early on is like, okay, this is what we have and this is how we're building on it. Even if we haven't done it. This is like the direction we want to take it. Because uh, I think that shows that you thought deeply about something that actually is really important for uh, the longevity of the company. We have a questioner that wants you to opine about the uh, future prospects for CRISPR therapeutics. So, yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's obviously a pretty broad uh, field. But I think, yeah, in terms of what we are excited about at Mammoth, definitely excited about in vivo therapies and really um, enabling the delivery of these uh, kind of novel systems, uh, especially things like CASV and CAS14 that are these ultra small systems. I think that's super exciting to us. Like what doors does that open in terms of uh, in vivo uh, applications? Um, it's definitely something that uh, is super exciting generally. Fantastic. What, um, um, in what's the next step for Mammoth? Where do, where do you see yourself going? How big a company do you think you'll be in a year's time? And what's the next sort of goal on the uh, whiteboard for you now? Sure. Uh, yeah, I think, I mean, it's easy to even underestimate, I guess, how uh, big things can get. Um, but in general, uh, from what we're doing at Mammoth right now, I think the next step for us is really starting to like push out our first products, which is super exciting. Like we have this uh, system called uh, Detector Boost, which is for uh, high throughput labs that we're very excited about. Um, and then more generally, just getting closer and closer to the clinic across everything that we're doing. And I think that's like a exciting frontier as well as like moving from basic research to like proof of concepts and you know, eventually uh, going to the clinic and just starting to see more and more the actual impact on people that we can mm -hmm. have in a positive way, mm -hmm. uh, I think will be something that's super rewarding. 
and it's pretty crazy for a company as young as us to have you know some products even coming out uh so we definitely don't take that for granted as well and that's a testament to like the immense amount of work that the team has done yeah. um and obviously uh the pandemic has like shown a spotlight on some of the things we've been working on since the beginning um so that's helped accelerate as well but those are clinical products that's great yeah. that's really exciting yeah, so on the diagnostic side, we have this uh, detector boost system that uh, we have some stuff on our website about for people that want to check it out. Um, so not available right now, but I'm definitely excited for that to launch soon. Yeah, I mean, this, this is, is one of the questions from um, the Q&A. Lambert have any plans for DNA data storage products? <laughs> um, yeah. I think in general, uh, we do like take a pretty broad view of like CRISPR as search engine. Uh, in terms of what we're focused on internally, we're definitely focused on human diagnostics and therapeutics. And if someone has excitement around these other areas, we're always open to working with people and partnering. So that's kind of what we're focused on. But I think, yeah, that's a whole field that's pretty exciting in itself. Uh, and there's a lot of uh, interesting work going on. It illustrates that it's like a platform technology, right? And there's other, other applications. And then one more IP question. Can one get a trade secret if you don't have a patent on the technology yet? And would that be good enough for investors? Well, I can't answer the first part of that because I'm not a patent attorney, but uh, it's a good question for a patent attorney. Um, but on the second part, uh, I mean, I think it all depends, right? Uh, I think in general, my impression of investor sentiment anyways, that uh, you probably want to have at least some angle that is patentable. <laughs> Trade secrets are nice, but uh, it's not something where you can necessarily defend it in the same way as a patent or uh, you know, exclude others from using that technique. Uh, so yeah, I would say my kind of just opinion of like what an investor might think is that it's probably not a replacement for like a really solid patent portfolio that you're gonna expand and defend. Yeah. It's a nice thing in addition, maybe. Yeah, I, I'll play the role of the investor. Yeah, <laughs> uh, possible, but there are very few Coca-Colas relative to the number of the companies built on uh, on patents. So, yeah, I think that would be tough. <laughs> Well, uh, Trevor, I can't tell you how much we appreciate your time today. This has been a fabulous conversation and um, and really uh, speaks to the sort of um, capacity of innovation of the ecosystem as a whole, More that it's so much more than the sum of the parts. And you're a beautiful, you've led from the start this ability to pull great people and investors together and make that uh, greater than parts argument work so beautifully. So thank, thank you, you so much for your time today and, and more importantly for your work. Yeah, I really appreciate y'all inviting me and definitely I'm excited about helping people make the jump in the startups. Um, so yeah, happy to chat with anyone that's interested in that after as well, because I know how hard it can be at the beginning. So try and help people out. That's really generous of you. And and congratulations to that being a Doug 50 under 50. So yeah, the other ones now. <laughs> Great work. Thank you again, Trevor. Really, really enjoyed the insights. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you so much, Trevor. Bye bye now.